What's it like to run Canada's most influential national newspaper? John Stackhouse did it for five tumultuous years, wrote about it in his book, Mass Disruption, 30 Years on the Front Lines of a Media Revolution, and he joins us now for 10 questions on life at the Globe and Mail. Hi, John. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Steve. Ready Thanks. to go? Here we go. Alrighty. Question one. How'd you end up at the Globe and Mail in the first place? I joined in 1989, like every young journalist at the time. I was probably wanting to give my right arm to work at uh, the Globe, was hired as a business uh, reporter. Uh, business writer for the monthly magazine, and those were the, uh, the sort of the golden years of, uh, of business writing. I mean, Canada had great business stories, the Reichmans, the Bronfmans, and people were genuinely interested in business and would read long-form stories about it. So it was, it was a remarkable time to, uh, to join the Globe and to be at the, uh, the forefront of business journalism in the country. Having said that, you may, question two, have made one of your more impressive marks doing a homelessness series in which you lived as a homeless person. Uh, how did that go and what was the feedback? I had just returned to Toronto from uh, more than seven years overseas as a, as a foreign correspondent and had, uh, had the luxury of seeing the city and the country to a certain extent with very fresh eyes. And my editor at the time felt it was a great opportunity to uh, look at an issue like homelessness uh, from a different perspective. Uh, I suggested living on the streets for a period of time, uh, picked a, a week which may have been too short or uh, uh, depending on your, your point of view, but it gave me remarkable insights uh, into what it was like to live. I stayed in shelters, I slept on the pavement. It was December, it was, uh, it was pretty, it was sub-zero at night. Uh, slept in a box in uh, Nathan Phillips Square and uh, panhandled, uh, had started the week with only five bucks in my pocket and had to beg to, uh, to buy coffee or food or however I was going to get through, uh, through the night. Uh, and just shared those observations uh, with, with readers, um, including some astonishing uh, observations about the amount of money someone can gain panhandling in the city. I think it was $225 in a day. Now it was grant granted around Christmas, so people are more generous, but it's remarkable how much uh, panhandlers gain, most of them uh, for the use of, uh, of crack, I discovered. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was remarkable to see what went on in the hostels, at, uh, or uh, the shelters, I should say, at, uh, at night. Uh, and so I documented that and thought this was, uh, these were insights and, uh, and information and stories worth sharing with the public. Had no idea the explosiveness of it at the time. Didn't really appreciate the politics of homelessness, having been abroad, and it lit a firestorm. Uh, in the city and frankly across the country. Maybe Canada needed that. Maybe we needed a more passionate debate about a social issue like homelessness, but astonishing to me coming back to Canada how polarized the readership or, the, or how polarized Canadians were becoming in the late 1999, early 2000. Question three. When you got the editor's job at the Globe and Mail, what did the publisher say your mission was? It was to continue to push but to accelerate the push to digital. Uh, it was clear that uh, digital was the future of any uh, news organization, quality or not, but certainly for the globe. Uh, so my mandate was to push uh, as, as hard as I could on digital and push as hard as I could on mobile, because clearly by, uh, by that time the iPhone was going to be a dominant platform of news c consumption. Um, we had no idea how dominant it would be, but uh, that was the mandate, to get our journalism, not to uh, really change the quality of the journalism or the focus of the journalism, which was national affairs, business news, and uh, international reporting from a Canadian perspective, and I'm glad that that remains so, but to get those, uh, that serious journalism onto new, onto new channels. Question four, a quote from your book. Journalists need to see their work as entrepreneurial and competitive, not tenured and enshrined. How much of the latter did you see when you were editing The Globe? I think you would find that in uh, many news organizations and frankly in any uh, traditional uh, organization that is facing disruption. But one of the challenges for newsrooms is to, and, and for journalists, is to think about the business model and how can journalists become more entrepreneurial. Many journalists are dying to do that. They want to control their own destiny. Uh, they want a more direct relationship with their readers and they want to find ways to, to to, to cover their salary or maybe enhance their, their take-home pay uh, through that, but certainly to, to protect their livelihood. Many of them don't want to leave that to some distant business model. So I, I, I was glad to look for ways to help journalists kind of build, build their own franchises. Question five. One of your owners said to you, can you do what you do at the Globe with 400 people instead of 
750 people. What did you think when he said that to you? Now, that number is all staff, not just uh, journalists. But it, it's an important question, and I think a good question for any news organization to ask. How many people do we need to be amazing at, uh, at what we do? If we were starting from scratch, how many people would it take to do something that really uh, stands out uh, in the market that we're going to be proud of, uh, that is going to build the loyalty of the readers we want reading us? Maybe it's the same number we've got now, so in this case, 750. Maybe it's half that. Uh, maybe it's a quarter of that. I, I, I don't know, uh, but I think that's an important question to ask. And I was always a little taken aback that, uh, that some journalists who, who uh, you know, claim to be open-minded and curious would not even uh, uh, broach that, uh, that question or be interested in the conversation. Question six. Can the newspaper be as good as it was if it outsources copy editing? Absolutely. Uh, now, th that's not to say that that guarantees the quality, and there, there's certainly outsourcing operations that dim have diminished the quality of content. Uh, we see this globally. But copy editing, uh, uh, and, and I, I started in the business at the Kingston Whig Standard as a copy editor, uh, is a, a, an enormously valuable art, and it is a, a, an art, but that doesn't mean it has to be done in shop uh, in every newspaper in, uh, in the world. And some have become very good at working with other operations, outsourcing firms that have figured out how to specialize in copy editing and do it at a world-class level uh, at, a, at a more economic rate than individual newspapers can do on their own. Question seven. In the lead up to the 2011 federal election, uh, your newspaper, The Globe and Mail, had an editorial backing Stephen Harper. You almost had a mutiny on your hands when you did that. Any second thoughts about that editorial? I've wrestled a lot with it uh, in, in, in the years since, but I still conclude it was the only choice that uh, was reasonable at the time. The Liberals were in no position to govern the country. Remember, we were just coming out of the financial crisis, uh, and it was very unclear where the world was going. Uh, the Conservatives had a much clearer economic plan than the Liberals did at the time. And I was even curious to read in Justin Trudeau's autobiography, which was published just before the election, that he had misgivings about the Liberals' position at the time and the, whether they were up to governing. And I got the sense he didn't think in 2011 they were up to governing. That was our conclusion. Uh, and one of the challenges of endorsing uh, a candidate or a party is that you've got to accept the choices that are on the ballot. Uh, democracy is not perfect. Democracy does not allow you to, to uh, fantasize or wish for some better choice. It uh, demands that you make the choices that are put before you. And that's, I, I felt very strongly that we had to choose uh, from the choices that were before the country at the time and that the Conservatives in 2011 were clearly the best choice uh, for the country. I'm not sure that view persisted after you left because that leads to question eight, which is the 2015 election editorial at the Globe and Mail. You had subsequently left, which was something like vote conservative, but not for Harper. What did you think of that? Well, that, uh, it, it wasn't unprecedented, by the way. I think the Globe in 2000 uh, endorsed the Liberals but called for the party to immediately overthrow Jean Chrétien, which was <laughs> an interesting piece of intellectual gymnastics to think that, uh, that you could e even suggest that. Uh, but I, I've always believed that you have to, to uh, help your readers make a choice uh, from the, 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 the options that are going to be on the ballot. Uh, and they're not perfect choices. Uh, now, one, one can go outside that and, and say, this is what we might want to think about, and that's uh, fair enough. But from my perspective, you've got to come help your readers come to grips with the choices and force them to think, which I've always felt is the greatest value of an editorial. You're not dictating to people how to vote. You're saying, here's a, a strong argument that we, we support, we endorse uh, uh, for, for the choices that are on the ballot. You make up your own mind, but you're going to have to come to grips with these choices and with the argument that we're making for a candidate or a party that is on the ballot. Question nine. Unless I missed it, and I did read your book pretty carefully, you don't tell us why you left the Globe. So why did you leave the Globe? We had a fundamental disagreement about the, uh, the direction of the organization going back to 2013, 20, uh, into early 2014. And I, I went to the owners in 2013 and said, look, I'm prepared to take the organization in this direction, and here's how I would do it. And if that's not what you want, I mean, you own it. It's, it's your call. Then let's, uh, let's figure out uh, a, a different way of, uh, of moving forward. And that's what, uh, 
what they decided. Okay, that, that begs a follow-up. So question 9A, what, what were the different futures that you both saw? I, I felt the organization needed to be much more focused on a few particular areas, and especially in the digital, digital realm in terms of national affairs and, uh, and business coverage. That, that would have uh, demanded some, some hard choices uh, so that more resources could have put, been put into those, those areas. And I, I hope the place continues to thrive uh, with the direction it's going. Question 10, you're not in journalism for the first time in a long time. What are you doing now? I work at uh, the Royal Bank of Canada as an advisor to uh, the CEO, and in some ways it's the same uh, mental exercise every day of trying to understand the world outside the bank and uh, help uh, the leadership of the bank and its board understand uh, whether it's economic shifts, social pressures, or technological pressures, disruption, what they should be, uh, what they should be thinking about. Gotcha. That's 10 questions for John Stackhouse, his latest book, Mass Disruption, 30 Years on the Front Lines of a Media Revolution. John, as always, thanks. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.